On today's episode of Uncommon Sense, we speak with Haley Stewart, author and editor of Word on Fire Spark. She'll speak about her upcoming talk at the 42nd Annual Chesterton Conference on Chesterton and Detective Fiction. Hello and welcome viewers and listeners to um, Uncommon Sense. My name is Joe Grabowski. I'm the VP for Evangelization and Mission here at the Society of Gilbert Keith Chesterton. And I am joined as always by my co-host, Gretelyn Darkey. Hi, Gretelyn. Hi, Joe. Good to be here today. And we are very honored to have uh, with us today one of the speakers from the upcoming Chesterton Conference, a popular author who now um, is w working with uh, Word on Fire's uh, publishing wing uh, sort of geared towards children uh, called Spark. Haley Stewart. Haley, welcome. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to chat. Yeah, I'm excited too. Um, so uh, maybe for our listeners, I know you've been interviewed on the podcast uh, before and, you know, we'll pop a, a little card up here uh, so that people can access that previous episode. Um, but uh, for those maybe who aren't familiar, maybe describe kind of your work as an author, what, what your interests are in, in that respect and how you came to be uh, with Word on Fire. Sure. So I originally started writing nonfiction. So I like to explore literature and faith. And so I wrote two books for grownups. And then over the past couple of years, I've, I've been writing books for children. So I started writing fiction. It's a little mystery series called the Sister Serafina Mysteries. And they're a, an order of mouse nuns who live underneath G.K. and Francis Chesterton's house in Beaconsfield. And they have a school for the village mice. And then they were inspired by Father Brown to start solving local crime. So they start solving little mysteries inspired by Father Brown. And that's been a lot of fun. So there are three of those little books and they are published by the Daughters of St. Paul. So Pauline Books and Media. And then about a year and a half ago, I started working full time as the editor of Word on Fire's children's imprint. And that has been very exciting. Kind of our first few titles will be coming out this fall. So everything I've been working on for the past year and a half, starting to see it come out into the world. And I got connected through to Word on Fire a few years ago, started doing some freelance you know, writing and content creation for them, um, but then got on board full time last year. So that's been wonderful. And I've got four kids ages four to 14. So um, that keeps me pretty busy. Sounds exciting. I'm I'm happy that they have you at the helm. I think uh, I, I, I've read your first detective book and I, I, I have to say my son is going to get them for Christmas this year. <laughs> he doesn't watch the podcast, so I can say that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, very delightful books. Uh, sort of a red wall flavor, but I, I don't know. I think there's something more to them. The Redwall books can be a little bit formulaic. Uh, so thank you for, for providing uh, some beautiful children's literature and, and helping to bring more into the world. We appreciate that. Well, it is, um, it's a job that's always fun. Like I almost, <laughs> I almost feel guilty because I feel like I get to work on all of the most fun projects mm -hmm. and do all of, all of the fun work. Mm, that's awesome. Um, well, shifting gears from, you know, the idea of children's literature, um, you know, the Sister Serafina books are also geared towards detective fiction. And you said uh, inspired by Father Brown and your uh, conference talk <clears throat> uh, this this year is going to be entitled Chaos is Dull, Chesterton's Mystery and the Delight of Order Restored. Uh, and so maybe unpack, give a couple of teasers on sort of what that talk's going to be about. And then I think maybe our conversation can dig a little more into the nature and insights of detective fiction more generally. But first, your 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 talk. Sure. So um, the title of the talk is drawn from a scene in Chesterton's The Man Who Is Thursday, which is 
detective fiction, but he it's the subtitle is A Nightmare. So, <laughs> you know, it's a very unhinged detective mystery. It's not at all like Father Brown. I, it was actually the first book that I ever read by Chesterton. I think I read it in high school and was co- very engaged with it because it's very exciting. But at the end, I was like, what did that mean? <laughs> No idea, um, but kind of a fun, odd way to get um, introduced to Chesterton. But there's a great scene where the character Gabriel Gabriel Syme, who's an undercover policeman and also a poet, is talking to a fellow poet who's an anarchist. And the anarchist is saying that poetry is a delight in disorder and... Um, Gabriel Syme, the undercover policeman poet, is trying to argue that chaos is dull and it's order that's really exciting and interesting. And And they talk about um, the the train tables, the, the timetables, that it's really, isn't it amazing that you can say you want to go to Victoria and lo, it is Victoria that you arrive at. Isn't it exciting? Um, whereas if you could go anywhere if it was just complete chaos there would no longer be anything remarkable about it and that's always been a really interesting concept to me because I think we often think of what is artistic as being what's avant-garde what has a little bit of chaos that's that's what makes something artistic and yet it's order that really is what draws the human the human heart again and again you know thinking about how excited people are to go back to the restored Notre Dame Cathedral. It's not because it's it's chaos. It's because they're going to walk in and see this incredible feat of, of architecture and order and beauty. And so it's interesting that that is what draws us in, um, despite this idea that what's artsy is is what's chaotic. And, and so I think it's also a fun jumping off place to talk about detective fiction in general, because what is so alluring to us as the reader is we've entered this story in this environment of chaos. There's, you know, justice needs to be restored. There's no order. We don't know what's happening. It's confusing. It's disorienting. And then the detective comes in and restores the order and and so there's this this shift so that at the end it's very satisfying because you've seen all the pieces get put into the right place and and everything's explained and it's all making sense again and it's interesting that mysteries continue to be just one of the most popular kinds of literature and even even ones that we don't think of as detective fiction say the Harry Potter series it, it's it's kind of detective fiction. It's just your detectives are three young wizards and they're trying to solve whatever mystery it is this year at Hogwarts. It's a little bit formulaic. Um, and so it's interesting that we continue to be drawn to that structure. Yeah, it's it's um, so much packed into what you said there that, that struck me. One being that insight about chaos and order from from the man who was Thursday, I've I've always loved that conversation. And really, you know, Chesterton is drawing upon the tradition that art is nothing less than the imposition of order on uh, elements that that don't necessarily have that intrinsic order or that intrinsic um, combination. You know, like uh, the he says, the essence of a picture is the frame. So there is a certain kind of order to nature that, but but when you impose on it the further order of framing it the right way, that's what changes, you know, mere holiday shots into true art, the art of of photography. And um, it also reminds me of Tolkien's uh, notion of subcreation, but then um, Dante, you know, referring to art as the grandchild or the grandson of God, uh, and what you know that we're participating in an act of creation in the mo- in the mode or model of the creator who when the uh what does he say the you know the earth was a void you know and god says let there be light you know uh he imposes the six days of creation are are all about that imposition of order on chaos and i think there's 
more than coincidence involved in the fact that the six days of creation are highly implicated in the book, The Man Who Was Thursday. So, <laughs> Oh, that's uh, a great, that's a great point. And um, I hadn't thought about that because at the end of the story, that's definitely a huge yeah. piece is hearkening back to the different days of creation. So, oh, I love that insight. Mm -hmm. um, but that's something I, I'm going to touch on in my talk a little bit, too, about um, starting out with the story of Genesis. You know, even the great story starts out with chaos and God moving in and restore, you know, creating order out of this chaos that this is um, this is part of the great story. And so detective fiction is in a way just reflecting back that structure of the, of the Genesis story and I find it very interesting that in Chesterton's fiction and a lot of that golden age of detective fiction, the detective is a little bit godlike as far as they're able to come in, they're able to perceive things that other people don't notice. They have this logic or reason or in Father Brown's case, this great insight into the human heart that allows him to be able to um imagine what could have happened in a way that other people would struggle to do. And then in contemporary detective fiction, whether it's books or whether it's detective mystery series, which are really popular TV shows, I love to watch them. Often you have a detective who is very not godlike, you know, very broken, either breaking ethical boundaries or mm -hmm. is maybe even mad. And so you, instead of having this sanity and, and logic and reason come into this place of chaos, you have this world of chaos and then you have the mad detective stumbling around in it. And so I think that's very interesting as well. Yeah. I mean, especially when you, uh, detective fiction is emerged as my favorite genre, <laughs> uh, may, maybe along with thrillers, but um, it's one of the, one of the few fun things I still consume. Uh, <laughs> um, but just thinking about that, it, it's it's interesting because you're, you're right, there is a sort of godlike quality to a lot of the Golden Age detectives. Uh, but then you get Dorothy Sayers, who introduces this. Uh, Peter's a little bit broken, but it's not the same. You know, it's not the same as these completely morally kind of bankrupt people that you often see uh, today. And it, it is kind of baffling sometimes to say, how, do, how are these people even bringing order out of chaos? When they don't even seem to believe in order. Like, what, what is happening here? Um, do you have any thoughts on, on the sort of, like, devolution, if not evolution, of, of fiction? Yeah. Well, I, I think my best example, like, counterexample um, to the Golden Age detective mysteries is a, it's a show called Marcella. It's a British mystery series, and the detective Marcella is um, actually kind of losing her mind. She's not sure mm -hmm. if she maybe committed the murder because <laughs> she keeps losing consciousness. And so I think that's the best example of just a completely lost detective in this chaos. Um, and I think that one of the reasons that's happening is – is if we're shifting from the Genesis story where you have God coming in and restoring order, if you take God out of the equation, then it's just us and we're a bit of a mess. So you have a very, almost a representative of very broken humanity going in to restore order um, and really struggling to do so. And I think there's a like there's a bit of truth to that, right? Where especially what you were saying about Tolkien's um, subcreation, you know, that we could be co-creators or co-participants in restoring order. That's something we're called to as Christians. You know, we're called to come in and and restore some of the goodness of the world as an imitation of of what God does, because we're made in His image. And so there is a truth to that broken detectives, if you will, are called into the world. Um, but I think that what's missing is any vestiges of Christian hope, like this sense of of Tolkien's like you catastrophe idea that mm -hmm. yes, it's looking very bleak. Even the detective is falling apart, but 
order is going to be restored. Justice is going to be restored. This is always going to be the end of the story. There's kind of this big question mark of, well, what, what is going to happen? Um, and so but I you think that's, know. that's part of it. If you don't, if right. you don't deliver, it's like, that wasn't a good story, you know, <laughs> <laughs> which I think is maybe what makes some of these um, series and, and detectives a little bit less satisfying. Um, I'm trying to think of some good kind of middle of the road examples. I think maybe Endeavor Morse would be a good example of kind of an in-between character. Mm -hmm. He's very flawed. He's struggling with addiction. He's kind of falling apart in some ways. Um, but you do have a sense that there is an, an inherent sense of justice and goodness in Endeavor mm -hmm. Morse. And he, he is flawed, but he is, he is trying and he does have this kind of, um, extraordinary perception and ability to, to logically reason out different crimes. So yeah, it's, it's, it is very... It's interesting. There's a mm -hmm. lot. It's kind of a, a spectrum of flawed detectives. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting too to think of you know what you what you call the golden age. And as as you were speaking, I was thinking to myself, there is sort of one outlier there, uh, who I think would be sort of in many people's opinion, sort of the apex of of the form, which is Sherlock Holmes, right? Who is, I mean borderline a sociopath really when you read the books right? he's not he is not an altogether uh person you know he's he's very much um alienated and, and a loner he uses opium cocaine at one point I, as i recall and um you know manically plays his fiddle and all this um and something i was thinking of is the contrast really between holmes and father brown in particular but I think this would also extend to other, to Poirot, uh, to to Lord Peter Wimsey uh, and and Harriet Vane, is that the jeopardy is in different Loki, if you will, uh, in in those stories, and and in Holmes, it is all internal because of the fact that the chaos. There is no real chaos in the world. It's only seeming chaos. But Holmes believes that, like, at root, and, and Doyle did, sort of as a materialist, even though he was also a spiritualist, but not, you know, he didn't have kind of the, the metaphysical faith that we do. He believed that, yeah, you know, nature in the end is intelligible um, it, without appeal to something outside of nature to render it intelligible and of course chesterton's in completely the opposite direction again look at the man who was thursday nature is the nature is S sunday's back you know that's the it's the chaos it's the and what renders it intelligible the only thing that renders it intelligible although it's maddening and unintelligible to the observer is the smile that sunday turns upon you so uh in a similar way father brown what i love about those stories is that he always thinks yeah it might be demons it might be <laughs> There could be a true, um, you know, metaphysical supernatural thing happening here, which, you know, he the closest throwaway lines where he's like, unless it's the devil or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, the closest Doyle ever gets to that is the Hound of the Baskervilles. But but there, too, you know, he he very, very deliberately vindicates the kind of materialistic uh, way of way of approach in the end. And I think that there's something very significant about that. Mm. No, those are great insights. As you were describing Holmes's um, issues, it almost made me think of that that line. I think it's at the beginning of Orthodoxy, where Chesterton's talking about madness and that it's it's the man who's lost everything but his reason. <laughs> That's almost like Holmes. He's yeah. so you know logical. He has this um, incredible ability of reasoning, but would be the opposite of Father Brown in that he really struggles to understand other human beings. Mm. And so mm. Father Brown, while he's not a logical genius and in this extraordinary way that Holmes is, because he is so versed in humanity and in compassion, ability to put himself in in the shoes of a sinner. He's so good at that, um, that that compassion gives him these insights that someone like Holmes probably would have a very difficult time reasoning those sorts of clues out. 
Yeah. I, I always get a little um, disappointed when I'm reading a detective story and someone's like, they wouldn't be capable of murder. I'm like, everybody is capable of murder. <laughs> Father Brown knew this. That's part of what made him so great is that he just, it's not even that he suspected everybody. He just knew, you know, we're all sinful. This is something we could all do. It's just, would this person do it this way or that way? And that's kind of how you figure it out. Yeah. Yeah, what's that great exchange between Brown and I think it's Flambeau, where Flambeau says, "Are you or, or it might be Valentin in um, in the Secret Garden, where uh, he says to Father Brown, are you the devil? Uh, and Father Brown says, no, I'm a man, therefore I have all devils within me. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> great line. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, before we get into a, a more on detective fiction, I think this is a good opportunity to take a quick break and acknowledge our uh, sponsors, including Word on Fire. Uh, at the upcoming uh, Chesterton Conference. So we'll be back in a moment. Uncommon Sense would like to thank the sponsors of the 42nd Annual Chesterton Conference, including Word on Fire Catholic Ministries. Word on Fire is a nonprofit global media apostolate supporting the work of Bishop Robert Barron to reach millions of people and draw them into or back to the Catholic faith at wordonfire.org. Franciscan University of Steubenville. Franciscan University educates, evangelizes, and sends forth joyful disciples empowered by the Holy Spirit. Learn more at franciscan.edu. Belmont Abbey College. Their mission is to educate students in the liberal arts and sciences so that all things may glorify God. Learn more at belmontabbeycollege.edu. And finally, Benedictine College a Catholic Benedictine liberal arts residential college educating men and women within a community of faith and scholarship at benedictine.edu. Thank you to all the sponsors and vendors that are participating in the 42nd Annual Chesterton Conference. To learn more about them or to greet them in person by coming to the conference, go to chesterton.org forward slash conference. And now back to Uncommon Sense. Okay, and we're back, and uh, you know, continuing on with this great conversation with uh, our guest Haley Stewart about uh, the nature of defec- detective fiction and um, Chesterton's, I, I, I think, singular approach, and yet, yet he is part of definitely one side of a tradition here. Um, and so, I guess, yeah, uh, any thoughts, Haley, on on why, you know, what is it that you have already touched upon this a little bit, but. Obviously, when we pick up something to read, uh, the the reading that we do forms us. It's also informed by what we're bringing to the, you know, when you're walking through the bookshelves, what you pick off the shelf is based on desires. Uh, What does it say that, you know, there is this great kind of Christian heritage of the detective story? Sure. Um, There's this, let me see if I can find, there's a great line from um, the author of Life of Pi, Jan Martel, talking about Agatha Christie's stories. And he he's claiming that there's really a close connection between both the morality of the Christian worldview and the structure of the narrative of detective fiction. Mm. And he says, the only modern genre that plays on the same high moral register as the Gospels is the lowly regarded murder mystery. Um, which I think is very interesting. He says, we find matching patterns and narrative similarities. They're maps of the same city, parables of the same existence. And he talks about Agatha Christie as a modern apostle, and um, but that we no longer live in an age of prophecy and miracle. So instead of having this explicit um, story of, of the gospel, there's this um, detective fiction are kind of these modern gospels for modern people where Jesus is kind of cloaked or obscured or hidden, but still whispering through the the structure of the narrative, which I think is very, very interesting. And um, it, it just, it does make sense that if we're looking at, you know, this detective structure of, of chaos to order, and ultimately this redemption at the end, this restoration of order that we can look at with wonder and awe, then it, it's just a very Christian structure. And so one of the reasons we're drawn to it is because we we see that it rings true in some way, that this 
this narrative structure um, does reflect what's truly real. But that also requires us to have, you know, have we had our imaginations formed by that kind of Christian narrative? Or um, does that simply come across as naive or wishful thinking? It's also a uh, detective fiction has to be grounded in, in a search for justice or it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. <laughs> right. And um, I think that's very interesting, too, that while as a society we like to think of how we've transcended the idea of objective morality, we keep watching these murder mysteries and we know a murder is bad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we want the bad guy to get caught. We want justice to be restored. It's, it's something that can't really... Um, that we can't escape. It's going to keep haunting us. Mm-hmm. It's also, though, a, a very interesting, and, and this is not uh, not in disagreement in any way, but but just food for more thought. Uh, and I don't, we don't even need to talk about it, but it just occurs to me, there's this interesting subversion of earthly expectations of justice in a lot of this as well. You know, like whether in so many different ways. Uh, Christy frequently will use suicide, right? <laughs> As sort of like the, the vengeance comes upon them, um, the criminals themselves. But then sometimes Poirot, just like Father Brown, lets the lets the person go, you know? Um, like that's, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that's the end of, well, spoilers. Uh, <laughs> that's involved in the end. I, I'm not going to give a spoiler. That's involved in the end of probably uh, Christie's most highly regarded uh, detective novel. So, um yeah it's an interesting thing that 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 the normal official channels of justice are subverted through these narratives too which i think also is sort of one of those winks towards a gospel that we put not our trust in princes of men but rather in in god and and in his eternal justice and uh therefore it's kind of quite fitting um that the classic form of this always sort of takes part outside of that. And it's also quite apt and quite a telling thing that in the modern age, the procedural courtroom drama (laughs) is the, is largely the inheritance of this, of this tradition, which I think shows part of that divergence of worldview. Mm, That's a really interesting point. And I think it's important to, to note that, Father Brown is an amateur detective. You know, he sees a priest. He's not um, employed by Scotland Yard or, you know, he's he's an amateur. And so is Holmes, which is is interesting, although he sometimes is, you know, teams up or is is sought out by the um, institutional justice. But yeah, that's that is very interesting. And also that what makes Father Brown particularly interesting is he's just as concerned with the fate of the criminal as he is with the victims. That there's a sense of the the criminal's um, soul is is one of his biggest priorities in this whole scenario. That he he wants this person to have remorse. He wants this person to. Um, to acknowledge to acknowledge their sin for the sake of their soul in hopes that things will go well for them you know not that they will receive a a punishment necessarily so that it is all very interesting i, I like that insight joe there's a there's sort of a more in in a lot of chesterton there's more of a pointing towards eternal justice um if you've ever read the man who knew too much which is my personal favorite uh detective that chesterton ever wrote um, he's so highly connected, he can't turn anybody in, you know, he's like, oh yeah, Lord so-and-so is the murderer, but he's my aunt's brother and I can't do, and he's like, he gives this whole example of like, and, and the guy is with him, it's like, what, what? Um, but there, but at the end of the book, again, spoiler, sorry, everybody, there's almost like a revolution and it's sort of this pointing towards like actual, um, uh, eternal justice is going to happen even here on earth a little bit but for these people it's like there's a hereafter (laughs) and things are going to play out the way that they're supposed to um because god is just so even if there's there's this idea of sometimes the criminal has to go free um there's an underlying christian message i think in a lot of chesterton that 
uh, justice will come at some point for this person. You just, you may not see it. Mm. No, that's a great point. Yeah. And, you know, it implicates further that idea of um, captured so well in the title of your talk, uh, Haley, that it's about the delight of order restored. And that's what we're seeking. And, you know, I think Chesterton was just uh, very much aware of what remains true in our day and, and was true in his day that, say, you know, life imprisonment or something, um, or even death row were not not systems well attuned towards rehabilitation of, of the individual. And so mm -hmm. he does sort of put that um, element forth uh, of Father Brown's concern for their eternal well-being, which I think we would do well to, to think more about. But it also reminds me of a quote that we quoted on a recent episode of this podcast with a, with another guest from Vatican II. It's funny how these things come up again and again, that it is God who makes man, the creature, intelligible to himself. So in other words, the creature is unintelligible. And I think of that trope or, or cl really cliche of so much detection fiction, which is somebody standing at the murder scene asking what kind of person can do this, you know, and as Gretelin pointed out, um, the kind with a pulse, right? <laughs> Ultimately, <laughs> that's, that's, and, and so I think it is trying to make man intelligible to us, uh, both in, in the valence of sin and, and redemption. Mm. And it's Father Brown's humility that makes him capable of doing what he does. It's, it's that sense of that he, but for the grace of God, go I kind of <laughs> attitude that allows him to explore these ideas in his imagination, knowing he could he could be that man himself. Mm -hmm. um, and as, you know, we love Father Brown and we think, oh, well, he would never do something like that. But I think he has the humility to to see or to understand how does this happen? How do human beings, you know, commit these sorts of crimes? Yeah, he has that beautiful uh, line or really paragraph in The Flying Stars where he's telling Flambeau, you know, you go down this path. This is where it's going to end up, and it's going to start out all Robin Hood and, you know, look really fun, but it's going to end up with you stealing from old ladies, and it's going to be ugly. Uh, and it's kind of this idea of, you know, the road to perdition is wide, and then, um, but it, but it's it's great. He gives him this chance. He says, it's, you can take this chance. You can turn around, and Lambeau, you know, I'll let you read it yourself. But uh, <laughs> it, it's a great, it's, it's. The, That's a good the one. The whole yeah, and the Father Brown Flambeau dynamic, I think, is one of the best in all of detective fiction. Um, the idea of the reformed criminal joining the detective and really being converted by him is is unique mm -hmm. and beautiful. So I think maybe bring bringing things a little full circle. We've we've talked about sort of the formation of the moral imagination in these things. Um, I was reminded too, and I can't lean on it because I can't remember where I came across it, but some somebody had compiled a list of the best modern detectives, and atop the list, this kind of shocked me, uh, was Batman. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> but when you think about it, he is. Yeah. He's using all these, like, CSI type things, and he's really, he's very analytical in that way, but he's also a violent vigilante, which I think, again, just food for thought there, uh, what what a difference is made. Uh, but but Haley, if we could maybe now bring it back, we've we've gone from children to detectives, and I think maybe back to children again with that question of moral imagination, because I think that many tuning into our podcast uh, might might have children or grandchildren who, you know, there's that question. We've we've already referenced one set of books on the podcast. I won't name them again, lest we open that can of worms about what kids should be reading. Um, I have my opinions on the subject, and I think they largely would jive with yours. But um, yeah, what what can you say about the importance of just good literature for kids and, and that being now part of your really vocation? Yeah, I think that um, it's just something that more and more I see being kind of at the center of my work is thinking about the the power of story and how stories form form us, our understanding of the world, our understanding of what story we are a part of, who we are in the story of our lives. You know, all of all of these different things are are so, so important. And I think that 
when our narrative through which we perceive the world is one without hope, for instance, then, you know, what problem does that not create? You know, is there so many problems for young people if they believe that they really are living in a universe that is one ultimately of chaos or ultimately of despair, um, where they are not known and loved by God and and created on purpose, you know, for for a reason. Mm-hmm. And so that's just kind of at the heart of my my passion to create books for children. And I think part of it is just understanding that as human beings, we are wired to understand ourselves in the world through stories. And that's why Jesus tells parables to the disciples, that he, he knows that God has created us in this way, that this is how we understand things is through stories. And how a story like, say, The Lord of the Rings when that's a story that forms our moral imagination, then doesn't that give us courage in the face of a seemingly <laughs> impossible situation? You know, and when when life looks very, very bleak, and um, I think for a lot of people, say 2020, we have a global pandemic, there's all kinds of, of problems in our society. And if we believe that ultimately it's a world of chaos and despair, then what, how do we, how do we navigate it? How do we orient ourselves? But if we look back to something like Lord of the Rings and see ourselves in a, in a grand story that ultimately is going to be a story of eucatastrophe where it's, things are going to turn. Um, And then when the, within a Christian understanding like as Father Brown would say, if if not in this world, in the next, that we, we cannot promise that things are going to all turn out as we would like. And yet we are part of a story of, of great hope. And so I think that that is what really inspires me, both writing for children and then editing and um, kind of helping form books to send out into the world for children, understanding that the stories we read as children are so formative to our conception of what kind of universe we live in and who we are within that universe and what we're called to do. Amen. I have a couple of kids myself and it's, it's so clear as they grow up that, you know, everything they watch, everything they read is forming them. I recently did another purge of my bookshelf just to get rid of some, <laughs> some gift books that I was like, um, so yeah, it's, it's so important. And thank you for, um, for helping to be the person who, who, who provides some books that are decent for our kids. Um, yeah. Well, it's my honor and it's the most, it's the most fun thing I get to do. So. <laughs> All right. Well, I, uh, I think that'll just about wrap us up. Any, any last kind of thoughts or words of wisdom for our audience, Haley? Um, yeah, I think that just looking to the, the popular, the continuing popularity, despite all these shifts that we discussed, the continuing popularity of, of detective fiction and, and mystery that um, speaks to our, our attraction to the true story, you know, the big grand story. I think that's something that Chesterton was very keen on and very good at, at drawing out and offering to us in, in his own detective fiction. Hmm. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Uh, Thank you once again. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thanks so much for having me. This was a lot of fun. And uh, Gretelyn, thank you for co-hosting again. It's been it's been a treat. Thank you. It's it's great. (laughs) And uh, to all of you watching, listening, um, please do give us a like, share this video, uh, comment in the comment box down below. We're trying to uh, both grow our audience, reach more people with uh, the joy that Chesterton brings, but also form a little bit of a community around this podcast. Get to know your fellow watchers, listeners, uh, leave those reviews, give us feedback, uh, constructive if possible, but, but any kind of feedback that you'd like to give, uh, only five star ratings though. Um, and if you are not yet, uh, planning to make it to this summer's Chesterton conference, there is still time, although space is limited. So go to chesterton.org forward slash conference. That's chesterton.org forward slash conference. There you will get to meet Haley. 
Uh, you'll get to meet uh, me and all of these other wonderful guests that we've had on the podcast over the past few weeks. Um, and you can learn more about their wonderful stories as well. And uh, if you can make it, uh, we would love to see you there and bring a friend. Because as we know, Chesterton is always better with friends. Until next time, God bless.